أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I greet you with the universal salutation of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. For our non-Muslim audience, the meaning of this is may the peace, mercy and blessings of Allah be upon you all. We are very privileged and honored from on behalf of the IPCI to have a very distinguished speaker, Sheikh Ahmed Didat, with us today. But we are even more so privileged to have a very dedicated Muslim, Dr. Yaqub Zaki, who has traveled all the way from Scotland to chair our meeting. And I hand you over to Dr. Zaki. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I welcome you in the name of the Islamic Propagation Center. And before we start the program, I would like to invite Ali Ismail Banda to do Tarawat al Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا يستوي أصحاب النار أصحاب النار وأصحاب الجنة أصحاب الجنة هم الفائزون لو أنزل هذا القرآن على جبل لو أنزل هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا خاشعا متصدعا من خاشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون هو الله الذي لا إله إلا عالم 
يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم صدق الله العظيم أحمد إذا بيسون الفاشن فهمي اسمه يسأل صلوة His tapes are distributed throughout the whole world. His debates with leading Christian and Jewish theologians are well known. Tonight we are privileged to hear him speak on a subject that is central to every Muslim's belief. When the speaker has finished, I will explain to you the format of the question and answer session. Mr. Lina. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا إن جتمأت الإنس والجن على أن يأتوا بمثل هذا القرآن لا يأتون بمثله ولو كان بعضهم لبعض زهيرا صدق الله صدق الله الرزيم مستر تشيرمن إن ماي ديا بدرن Listening to the beautiful recital by the Qari, I was being tempted to change the topic from Al-Quran, the miracle of miracles, to what the Qari was trying to draw our attention to. Just a word. He was reading, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشيا متصدعا من خشة الله. said had this Quran been revealed upon a mountain, the mountain would have shuddered and shaken. لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشيا متصدعا من خشة الله. وتلك الأمثال. نَدْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Allah says, I'm giving you this example. I'm giving you this similitude that you may understand. And we do not understand. What an irony. I heard Qari Abdul Samad Abdul Basit, the veritable voice from heaven, the man from Egypt. You might have heard him. In his heyday, Qari Abdul Samad Abdul Basit, he was reading this in his own inimitable way, beautifully. He said, oh, I can't reproduce it. The Qari might try, I can't reproduce it. But when he reads that, in that beautiful sonorous voice, with that unimaginable breath control, And he reads, لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل إلا رأيته خاشيا من خشة الله. When he finishes that, then as if talking with you, he says, وتلك الأمثال نذربها للناس إلا علهم يتفكرون. And again, he starts. And then he says, he's talking to you. He says, Allah is telling you this that you may understand. He did it three times. And the bulk of the people who are listening, most of us. Nobody understood a word. What an irony. So I was tempted to go on in the train, but as advertised, the topic is Al-Quran, the miracle of miracles. In the ayah I read to you from Surah Bani Israel, Bani Israel, where do you find Bani Israel in the Quran? 
if you have a translation at home, which makes it an encyclopedia, this particular one by Abdullah Yusuf Ali, don't worry about the shape and the size. Every Abdullah Yusuf Ali's translation is the same, page for page. It might be larger, it might be bulkier, depending upon the type of paper that is used. But page for page, every Yusuf Ali's translation is the same. Almost 2,000 pages. 114 surahs. And where will you find Bani Israel? Where? How? Very difficult. Especially for us non-Arabs. I don't know how easy it is for the Arabs. But especially for us Muslims who are non-Arabs, how do you find Bani Israel? Now if you have a translation like this, don't worry about the color. It can be any color. If it's Yusuf Ali, it's Yusuf Ali. At the end of it you'll find an index. A very comprehensive index. What do you want to know? For the moment we want to find Bani Israel. So open B, like in a dictionary, at the end, B. Look for Bani, B-A-N-I, and Israel, I-S-R-A-E-L, Israel, Bani Israel. You find Bani Israel, this is chapter 17, very easy to find, because every page is numbered. Every page is numbered. Then I say, ayah number 88, 88 is easy to find. And you owe it to yourself, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. For the non-Muslim, I say, you owe it to yourself to find out this book of the Muslims, one billion Muslims in the world today, one-fifth of the whole human race, they believe in it as the veritable word of God, Allah's Kalam. Whether you agree or not, you owe it to yourself to find out what does this book say on the different subjects about your Jesus, about the judgment day, about heaven or hell, anything, what do you want to know? What does this book say? From that point of view, a belief of a thousand million people, you ought to know what is the foundation of that religion. So you owe it to yourself to get a book. The Muslim, you have no choice. You've got to have a book. Even if you understand the Quran direct in Arabic, you are an, a scholar of Arabic, even then I say you need a translation. Forgetting that look, the Mauritian, the Pakistani, the Bangladeshi, whoever you are in this environment, in Britain, it's imperative that you have a translation. Because you may understand the Quran in your own dialect. Between you and Allah, no problem. But as soon as you try to share this with the unbeliever, it will be difficult for you to find the appropriate words. So therefore, everybody needs a translation in this environment. And the Quran, I understand, is made available by the local IPCI, Islamic Propagation Center International. They are available a volume of 2,000 pages for six pounds. Get it for yourself. Get it for every member of their family, if you can afford it, that you can sit together around a table once a week and make your son or daughter to start from the beginning. You say, my son, my child, read it and explain to your mother. My daughter, read it, explain to your mother. And around the table, the family, around the Quran, inshallah, it will create a bond which nothing else can. I suggest to you that you get the Quran or Qurans and to give to your non-Muslim employers or employees, share it with them. Now I said, Bani Israel, chapter 17, ayah number 88, easy to find. There is another way of getting at this. The topic that you are discussing. I give you a reference and you can check it up. But there is another way of getting at this. This ayah, suppose you didn't know about Bani Israel and all that. In the Quran, under Q, look for Quran. What does the Quran say about the Quran? What does the Quran say about itself? You don't know what Muhammad says. What does the Quran say about Muhammad? Big list. Everything that the Quran says about our Nabi Karim is there. What do you want to know? So you look under Q Quran and it will tell you that no, nobody can produce this book except Allah. Where do you find it? It will tell you 1788. Again, you can have reference to this book. Find chapter 17 verse 88. That this is Allah's Kalam. No man, no group of men or spirits can produce this book. That is what Allah challenges. 
pull. Our Nabiya Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is commanded to say, tell them. لَإِنِ اجْتَمَأَتِ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنِّ أَلَا عَنْ يَعْتُوا بِمِسْلِ هَذَا الْقُرَانِ That if the whole of mankind and the spirit world were together together to produce the like of this Quran, say, لَا يَعْتُونَ بِمِسْلِهِ وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْدٍ زَهِيرًا So they'll never be able to produce the like thereof, even if they backed up each other with help and support. In other words, Allah says it is impossible. Impossible for the whole of mankind and the jinns, your computerized systems, the modern jinns, involve them. See whether you can work things out to produce anything like it. You'll never be able to produce it. That makes it a miracle. Not only what I'm telling you, but non-Muslims testify to that. Reverend Bosworth Smith, in his book, a Christian missionary, in his book, Muhammad and Muhammadanism, you know that's a wrong term. There is no such thing as a Mohammedan and there is no such thing as Mohammedanism. We use this term for ourselves because this is how the Westerner described us. In my youth, when I went to school, in my country, you see, the Muslim boys and the Hindu and the Christians, we all school together. Indians, all Indians together, whether Hindu, Muslim or Christian. So, first thing in the morning, the teachers, take off your hats! So everybody, the Hindu boys or the Christian boys, they have the hats or caps, they take it off, and they take it off. We used to wear those red faces those days, Turkish face, you know, like the Turks. I said, what's wrong with you? Why don't you take off your hat? So he said, we are Mohammedans, sir. So we Mohammedans, this is the way we show respect to you, not by taking it off. Accept it. All the boys, Hindus and Christians, they wear knickers, short pants. We wear long pants. So why are you Muslims wearing long pants? We say, we are Mohammedan, sir. We didn't know that we were Muslims. See, because the white man is calling us Mohammedans and we think that's the label. He calls our religion Mohammedanism, so we call it Mohammedanism. We didn't know Islam. It took us a long time to realize that we are not Mohammedans because the Westerner is calling us that because he is assuming that we are the worshippers of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa the Christian, they say, we are Christians because we worship Christ. Fair definition. The Buddhists worship Buddha, so they are Buddhists. Fair definition. But there is no worshipper of Muhammad to have a Muhammadan. They don't know that, but they think we worship Muhammad. He says, no, we don't worship Muhammad, we worship Allah. Muhammad is the servant and messenger. We love, respect and revere him, but he is not our God. But in his book, Muhammad and Muhammadanism, Reverend Boswat Smith, speaking about our Nabi Kareem sallallahu the Holy Prophet Muhammad and the Quran, he says, illiterate himself, man unlearned in Ummi, illiterate himself, scarcely able to read or write. He was yet the author of a book. We know he was not the author of a book. Muhammad is not the author of this book. The author of the book is Allah. But since the Westerner, he thinks because Muhammad uttered it, he had it dictated, he is the author. So he says, he is yet the author of a book, which is a poem, a code of laws, a book of common prayers, and a Bible all in one. And is reverenced to this day by a sixth of the whole human race as a miracle of purity of style, of wisdom and of truth. It is the one miracle claimed by Muhammad. His standing miracle, he called it. And a miracle indeed it is. This is an enemy talking. A Christian missionary. It's indeed a miracle. What, what he saw, I can't tell you. He didn't tell me. But he says it's a book. It's a miraculous book. On the very face of it, you look at this book. It's an encyclopedia. We know Muhammad didn't write it. But for the sake of argument, we, we agree with the enemy that Muhammad wrote the book. In that case, this is a, a one-man job. If he wrote it, you know, he didn't. But for the sake of argument, I hope you people understand the English that I'm talking. Because guy is going to go outside and say, this guy did that, said Muhammad wrote the book. I'm telling you, he didn't write the book. 
But we are talking for the sake of argument. The guy says the non-Muslim he can't understand is a Muhammad wrote the book. I say, all right, Muhammad wrote the book for the sake of argument. You understand my language? I hope so. I hope so. Because I'm finding great difficulty. You know, my people, most of them expatriates, just come from India, first generation. They have learned a smattering of English, and now when I'm talking, they can't understand. I mean, it's difficult for me. I don't know. I'm used to talking, talking, and I talk, and I think the guy has understood, but he has misunderstood. And he wants to kill me for that. <laughs> they are good, they're sincere, but they want to kill me for what I'm talking. I say, for the sake of argument, let's say Muhammad wrote the book. Now please, 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 these things will happen, shaitans, iblises all over in the world, they will be there, you see, don't worry about them. Right. So, this is a one-man job, if he wrote it. Compared to that, we have an encyclopedia here, called the Holy Bible. Ask any Christian missionary, how many people authored this book? And the Christian missionary, the priest will tell you 40 different authors went to produce this book. This is the Protestant Bible. It has 66 books inside, booklets. All put together is the Holy Bible. How many people went to produce this? Six, uh, 40, 40 different authors. The Roman Catholic Bible has 73 books. So you add another 5 more authors. It will be 45 authors to write the Roman Catholic Bible. This one, 40. This one, according to the unbeliever, one man job. Compare. One man did this, 40 persons had to do that. So can you see now? And this man is an ummi. Ummi means unlearned, unlearned, unlettered. He doesn't know how to read or write. And yet he produces this. Paul, Paul, Saint Paul, he wrote more than half the New Testament, St. Paul, in the New Testament. This book is divided into two parts, Old Testament, New Testament. In the New Testament there are 27 books of sheaves, little booklets, 27. Out of that 14, that's more than half, more than 50% were written by one man. But if you just put them together, those 14 books is nothing more than this, what you see here. So, I say it's a miracle. In itself, it's the, the volume of the work and the things that he's talking, the, the solution he's giving to your problems, I say it's a miracle. But now, Allah Bari Ta'ala is drawing your attention to something more than that. What is a miracle? Let me give you a, a brief definition. What is a miracle? A miracle is an event that appears so inexplicable, something you can't explain, by the laws of nature, that it is held to be supernatural in origin or an act of God. Miracle, number one. Number two, definition. A person, thing or event that excites admiring awe. Number three, an act beyond human power and impossibility. Miracle. Like for example, in this heat, somebody faints. And we try to revive the person and we fail. We shout for a doctor and the doctor comes along with the stethoscope and he says he's gone. He's expired. Certified dead by the doctor. Prepare for burial. Take it away, the cops. Give it a ghusl, prepare for burial. But there comes along a man of God. He says, no man. This man is alive. He says, Ahmad, wake up. And Ahmad gets up. We would say it's a miracle. Man was certified dead and he is revived instantly. Miracle. Impossibility. But if the person was dead for three days and put into the mortuary in the morgue, frozen, and after three days somebody comes along, a man of God, and he calls the person, he says, Kumbiznillah, that by the command of God, wake up! And the guy comes out of the mortuary, hale and hearty. We say it's a greater miracle. Greater the impossibility, greater the miracle. But after centuries, the body has decayed, mingled with dust, 
and there comes along a man of God or a trumpet is blown and everybody gets out of the grave as they were we say still a greater miracle the greater the impossibility the greater the miracle so here is the book let's try and produce one like it that's a challenge Allah says come on produce one like it and you have had 1400 years to do the job and the world has not been able to produce one but there are people who have good excuses like the British they say we don't know Arabic the Germans we say we don't know Arabic the Americans say we don't know Arabic it's a good excuse but I says do you know that there are 15 million Arabs still extant in the world today and they are not all nincompoops they are learned people among them the first book I tried to learn Arabic as a boy young fellow and I went to the booksellers and I fought, found a book called Egyptian Arabic by Spiro Bay I thought Spiro Bay was a Muslim later on I found he's a Christian Arab but the Arabic was there I learned from that book many years ago Wahid is one, Ithna is two, Thalassa is three and all that I learned it then you know so many years ago but I haven't mastered Arabic yet but however the first book I handled in Arabic was written by a Christian Arab there are so many Christian Arabs 10 million in Egypt alone in the Lebanon and all over the world 15 million produce something like it and the world has failed to produce impossibility that you have the ability nobody is gagging you nobody is tying your hands linguistically you know the language maybe better than the Muslim Arabs but you can't produce the like of this book because it is Allah's Kalam and it is a miracle now mankind has a habit of asking men of God for things supernatural to believe to make them to believe a man of God comes along he wants to guide mankind to the right path to the way of God for your benefit but man says no I want to see you perform some tricks do something man that we can't do fly in the air like a bird or walk on the water or give light to the dead this is what mankind is doing all the time and they did it to Jesus the predecessor of our Nabi they did it to him you read in the gospel of Saint Matthews in the Bible in the Christian Bible Gospel of Saint Matthews chapter 12 verses 38, 39, 40 the Jews come to Jesus he said I am your Messiah the man you are waiting for the Messiah I am he so this is no man that doesn't satisfy us we want you to show us a miracle so they come to him and they say master in the Hebrew language Rabbi Moli Sahib Sheikh Jashah sarcastic they're sarcastic but they say Moli Sahib Ya Sheikh Ya Imam we would have a sign of thee we want you to show us a miracle that will convince us that you are the candidate we are waiting for so Jesus is angered he said the things that I'm telling you I'm trying to lead you to God his will his plan and you want me to do some juggling tricks you think I'm a circus uh, an acrobat in the circus or a clown so in anger he said an evil and adulterous generation seek it after a sign what a horrible people but there shall no sign be given unto it except the sign of the prophet Jonah for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth no sign except one what are you looking for but this is the sickness of man we will not go into the pros and cons what happened what not there is a booklet available I don't know you have it at the IPC at this IPC I here in London you get that booklet it's only 12 pages it's a small booklet this size of 12 pages you master that and there isn't a Christian boy who can stand before you just that but of course you won't do homework you want to take a pill and become a superman no, no, this is, this is my nation. I know my soldiers. 
you want the whole work. I said, look, this booklet can't help you. It's an instruction book. Without you practicing the instruction, just reading a book on boxing, you can't become a boxer. Reading a book on karate can't make you a black belt karate expert. You read a book on swimming, you know, the crawl and the stroke, and you can't become a swimmer. You have to get into the water. That booklet, if you use it, memorize the verse, and you go to town, and there is no looking back. But I doubt if you will have that kind of that enthusiasm. This is okay. This is good entertainment. I don't know. You are entertained. Inshallah, I'll get the sawab, the blessings. So I'm trying to share with you. But I know, generally, it's all entertainment. You come along to be entertained. However, 600 years after Jesus, when our Nabi Kareem wasalam, makes the claim that Allah has chosen him, same thing. The Quraysh come to him, they say, وَقَالُوا And they say, لَوْ لَا أُنْذِلَ عَلَيْهِ آيَاتٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِ Say, why is not a sign, a miracle sent down to him from his Lord, from Allah? So, our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is meant to say, قُلْ كَلْرَمْ إِنَّمَ لَا آيَاتٌ إِنَّ اللَّهِ Most certainly signs, miracles are in the hands of Allah. وَإِنَّمَا أَنَا نَزِيرٌ مُبِينٌ I am only a clear-cut warner. That's my job. Mine is not to entertain you. I am not an circus acrobat or a clown. I have come to deliver the message. إِنَّمَا الْآيَاتُ إِنَّ اللَّهِ إِنَّمَا أَنَا نَزِيرٌ It continues. Awalam yakfihim. Allah says, is it not enough for them? Anna anzalna alayk al kitaba. That we have revealed to you the book, O Muhammad. That should be enough. You go up in front of them. They know you as much as they know their own sons, as much as they know their own hands. How could you have produced this book? Is it not enough for them? أَنَّا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ يُطْلَعَ عَلَيْهِمْ which you rehearse unto them إِنَّ فِي ثَالِكَ لَرَحْمَةٌ وَذِكْرَ لِقَوْمِ يُمِنُونَ This is drawing our attention of the mushriks, the unbelievers again and again look at the book the book itself proves itself that this is no man-made job look at the book Again and again, look at the book. In other words, the miracle you're looking for is here, in front of you. Reverend Boswell Smith testifies. There are others, A.J. Arbery, a Britisher. He translated the Quran into English. It's available here, very good English. But it has two disadvantages. That is, it has no index and it has no commentary. And I suggest to my brothers and sisters that if you ever want a translation, look for a translation which has a commentary. Without a commentary, it's too heavy. The Quran is not a storybook or a fairy tale. Once upon a time, the fox and the grape, the wolf and the lamb, it doesn't talk like that. So it's a very concentrated book. It has to be diluted for us. We are like little children, like little babes. We have to have, to have it diluted. Commentary, tafsir, must have. Number two, it must have an index. Because without an index, again, we are lost. A Christian is asking you, what does your book say about my Lord Jesus? So where do you start paging through? You know, if you have this book with the index, it says look for J. Under J, look for Jesus. First item, a righteous prophet. He's a true prophet of God. Chapter 6, verse 85. Second item, his birth, described in two places. Chapter 3, verses 42 onwards. Chapter 19, 23 onwards on your fingertips. Jesus Christ is mentioned in this book of God no less than 25 times by name. Where is the name of our holy prophet Muhammad in this book which he is supposed to have written occur only five times. I account for that. Why would a man go out of his way to speak about Jesus and his mother and enshrine in his book a chapter called Maryam means Mary there is no chapter in the Quran named Aisha 
or Khadija or Amina his mother or Fatima his daughter, nothing. But there is a Surah Maryam, chapter Mary. I say, I come for that. And again and again, you can't account for it. He goes out of his way to exonerate Jesus. The Jews and the Christians, they were at loggerheads in the time of our Nabi, as they are at loggerheads now, but they have united against us. So they were at war on the subject of Jesus. The Jews said that because he has got no earthly father, he is the illegitimate child of Mary. That a Roman soldier by the name of Pandera, he raped Mary and this offspring is the result of that rape. Astaghfirullah. This is what they say in the Talmud, the Jewish holy book, the Talmud, that he is the illegitimate child of Mary. In common language, you know what, it, what they say. The Christians say because he's got no father, his father is God. What is our position? What does the Quran say? What must we say? What stand must we take? It would suit us at that time in history to suit our Nabi and the Sahabas to carry favor with the Jews. They say, what you say, 100%. 100% would agree with you. Because it's the easy way out. Then what the Quran makes us to do, to believe that Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. That Jesus Christ was born miraculously, without any male intervention. To believe that he was a Messiah, translated Christ. That he gave life to the dead by God's permission, and he healed those born blind and lepers by God's permission. Now with all that load, it's harder to fight. The Christian can fight very easily. He can call him and be an imposter, search and search and search. You can't do that to Jesus. You can't insinuate anything about Mary. We are tight. Our lips are tight. We accept what Allah tells us in the Quran. What does it say to the Jews and the Christians? It says, Qul, tell them, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, La taghlu fi dinikum. He says, do not go to extremes in your religion. Don't go to extremes. وَلَا تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْحَقِّ And don't say anything about Allah except the truth. إِنَّمَا الْمَسِيحِ مُوسَى تُلِّي مَسَيَا Translated Christ. إِسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَا Jesus the son of Mary. رَسُولُ اللَّهِ He's a messenger of Allah. وَكَلِمَتُهُ And a word proceeding from him. أَلْقَاهَا إِلَى مَرْيَمُ وَرُوهُمْ مِنْهُمْ Which he bestowed upon Mary and his spirit. Proceeding from him. فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرُسُلِهِ So believe in Allah and His Messenger, Jesus. That there is but one God, and Jesus Christ is His Messenger. This is what we Muslims are made to believe, and we accept. No arguments. However, this ayah I quoted you about the signs, signs, is in Surah Ankabut. Ankabut. Where do you find Ankabut? I said, go to the, the index. And the A, look for Ankabut. It'll tell you chapter 29. Once you find 29, it's a look for ayah number 48, 49, 50. You got it. And make a habit. Anybody gives you any reference, go and check up in the Quran at home. Not that you doubt the speaker. You would have proved him wrong. No, no, no. I said, look, you mentioned this. I like it. It tickled me. I want to go and verify for my own benefit. Because once you go through it again, in your own eyes, in your own mind, you read it, it becomes your property. That knowledge, at the moment, is entertainment. Once you go and see it in the privacy of your own home, or read it to your children, to your wife, to your daughter, you say, look, oh yes, this is what Ankar did, did that was speaking, and I can see, look, this is what it says, and read the commentary. Once you do that, that becomes a part of your own knowledge, and you can in turn share with others. So this is the habit I am recommending it to you. Types and types of miracles. You see to the man of science. Suppose you want to approach a man of science. And you want to prove to him that this book is a miracle. Everything in here is a miracle. But now you have to, not just saying it is not enough. You have to prove it to him. So look, I'd like to know from you, the man of science, the atheist, the agnostic, the man of learning, general is a man of learning. He said there is no God. He knows so much. He knows how to account for things. 
He said, look, this is how it's working, the solar system. You see, our Earth is rotating on its axis at a speed of 1,000 miles an hour. It gives us 24 hours to for one revolution. And this is what happens. It's on an axis, and this is the use of the axis. Why is it turning like that and not perpendicular? He said, you see, if it was doing like this, then there will be no seasons, there won't be any life, and all and all. He'll explain to you, beautiful explanation, he'll give you. Why this and why that? Why the gases are in this combination? Why not that? I said, look, we won't be here to argue if it wasn't so. Everything must be the way it is. The distance from the sun, the distance from the moon, everything must be exact. You bring the sun any nearer, no life. If you take it any further, no life. If you reduce the speed of this earth by half, no life. If you double it, no life. Amazing. Everything is made for us as if tailor-made. You need this exact. And who, who tells you all this? The guy who doesn't believe in God. He's telling you all these things. So you ask him, I said, look, this, our, our, our solar system, how did it come about? Tell us. And he's ready. He's ready to share with you. That is not a miser. This man of science, you prod him, you ask him for information, and he'll come out. He wants to tell you, because it gives him joy, pleasure. So he said, you see, this universe of ours was one mass, millions of years ago. And there was a big bang. And out of that big bang, the solar system came into being. Everything started moving. And since there was no resistance in space, and it carries on, and everything carries on, and all that machine is carrying on. Mashallah. Beautiful. I said, when did you find this out? He said, yesterday. <laughs> no, really, 50 years is yesterday in the history of man. 50 years ago. He said, yesterday. You know, just now. And it's a fact. 50 years is yesterday in the history of man. And an illiterate man in the desert, 1,400 years ago, who had no telescopes and no mathematical, he couldn't work out anything in mathematics, nothing. In the desert, no libraries, no learned people. Nobody in the world knew at that time. At that time in the history of mankind, this man says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Do not the unbelievers see? This guy who said there is no God, can't he see? Can't he see? As if Allah is saying that look if the Badoon in the desert, if he didn't grasp my presence, I can understand. This barbarian, this cannibal in the Congo, if he can't understand, I can understand. I can sympathize with him. But you, with all your learning, how can you not see him? Do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were joined together as one unit of creation. And he split them asunder. And where did life come from? Ask him, the biologist. Where did life? He said from the water. Billions of years ago, life originated in the sea. Everything, protoplasm and amoeba, and this is what happened. And a group of them, they chose for themselves that we'll make ourselves into an elephant. Another group said we'll make ourselves into a man. Another group will say we'll make ourselves into a monkey. Another into a cockroach. Another into a lice. But how, where did life come from? He says water. When did you find that out? He said yesterday. Because 50 years is yesterday in the history of man. It's a recent discovery. An illiterate man in the desert, he couldn't have told you that, could he? 1,400 years ago, said, never. Well, listen to him. He says, And he's made from water every living thing. Will you then not believe? How can you not believe? You ought to believe. This is what your knowledge is telling you, and this man is telling you 1,400 years ago in the desert, he spelled it out for you. Where did he get the knowledge from? Except from the creator of the Big Bang. Except from the creator of, the, of, of all creatures, life from water. How did Muhammad know this? Did he have microscopes? Did he go to the sea and look for it in the water? Any life, life germs? No. This is 
coming from the Almighty. It's a miracle. That an illiterate man can tell you this 1,400 years ago in the desert, which are only confirming today. <laughs> My dear brothers and sisters, there is so much. I have written a book on this topic. Al-Quran, the miracle of miracles. That book is still in the ship. We try to ship it before time that people could have it. But unfortunately the ship is in, but it's going to take us another week or ten days to clear it. As soon as the book is clear, Al-Quran, the miracle of miracles, it will be available from the Islamic Propagation Center, dealing with so many different aspects of the Quran being a miracle of miracles. But let me give you something very easy that you can take with you home. A book, any book, if it claims to be from God, we want to know what it says about God. No? We want to know, this book you say is from God, the Bible is from God, the Bhagavad Gita is from God, the Ramayana is from God. So, okay, let us see what the book says about God. So, in this particular volume I'm talking about, which is available there, outside, you owe it to yourself to take one home. No more than one home. And I assure you, I will not get any commission. No commission from me. And my commission is with Allah, inshallah. He will give it to me. I'll just give you a few of the subjects, the topics that this book speaks about God. If a book comes from God, I want to know what it says about God. Fair? Let's see what he says out himself. So we open the book and the G, look for G, 144 references. If I just start reading that alone, mm, 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 I, I don't want to waste your time. Just to give you a few. First item, God. He is your cherisher, Lord, sustainer, evolver. Chapter 1, ayah number 2. He is your guardian, Lord. He is as a guardian on a watchtower. He is your protector. He sets guardians over man. He is the helper. Help of God, how to be celebrated, and on and on. He is the Lord of all bounties. Lord of bounties. His bounty is open to all. He is most bountiful. He is merciful. He is most kind. He is full of loving kindness. He is beneficent. His love bestowed on the righteous. He is forgiving. He guides his favors. He is the orphan's shelter. He is the wondrous guide. He satisfies your needs. God. God present everywhere. He gives you life. He gives life and death. He takes the souls of men. To him go back all questions for decision. In the final, he is the arbitrator. What he tells you is right is right, what is wrong is wrong. He will tell you this is black, it's black. He will tell you it's white, is white. His unity, that is one and only, so many references. He is one, not one in a trinity. Not one of two. He has got no begotten sons. He's got no consort, no daughters, no partners. He's wise and on and on and on. Wallah, 144 references. We know Allah. How do we know Him? Through His attributes, His qualities. In the ayah that Taqari read, He gave His attributes. He is Allah besides whom there is no God. Al Malik the King, Al Quddus the Holy One, As Salam the source of peace and perfection, and on and on and on. And Allah gives us 99 attributes whereby we might know Him. He is just, He is merciful, He is loving, He is bountiful. He is compassionate, He is omnipotent, He is omniscient and on and on and on. 99 attributes. With the pendant, a necklace of 99 attributes. With the main pendant, Allah. A proper noun, Allah. Where did this man get it? He says he was inspired by God. And he doesn't give you like in a dictionary. He's interspersed throughout the Quran. The jewels, the pearls are all interspersed. Most beautifully done. You don't, you're not aware that somebody is going out to contrive a list. This man of God, he gave us 99 attributes. You clever man, you professor of language. I would like to know how many can you guess, concoct, come on, try. How many? You know the cleverest of us can't do more than a dozen. Try, try, try the clever guys that you know. 
doctors, lawyers, professors. He said, come on now, think, 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 man, tell me. Give me some attributes of God. He said, well, he's kind, yes, he's merciful, yes, he's holy, yes, yes. You know, come, come, come. He couldn't go beyond the desert. I said, this illiterate man in the desert, he gave you 99. So the guy said, look, he's a genius. And a genius can always do 10 times better than us. Fair. That's fair. I said, well, he's accounted for it. He said, once you bring it down on his level, he said, look, he's a genius, man. We concede that Muhammad is a genius. We took our hat to him. Finish. He doesn't have to accept it. Once he concedes, he says, look, he's a genius, man. He's better than me. Ten times cleverer than me. But I said, right, that doesn't make it a miracle. He said, no. But now I said, I'll show you the miracle. The miracle is that the one he kept out of the book. <laughs> Amazing. Not the 99, but the one that is not there. That makes it a miracle. So how can that be? I said, you see, for 23 years, it took the Holy Prophet Muhammad 23 years to dictate this. Complete. 23 years. During the course of the 23 years, he gave us 99. Which you say, because he was a very clever man. But I say, you now, in the list that you are giving me, within the first half a dozen, within the first six, you must talk about the Father in heaven. As an attribute, Father. He is our Father. The loving Father in heaven. Beautiful. It's a beautiful term, expression. The Father in heaven. Oh, our Father which art in heaven, the Lord's prayer. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Beautiful. But we in Islam, we eschew it. It is un-Islamic. The expressions, beautiful sentiments are good. But the Muslim will not take it. Because our Nabi Karim Sallallahu he didn't do it. Allah Bari Ta'ala made him to see that that word father was not one of those attributes. Instead of father, in Arabic is Ab. In Hebrew is Ab. Ab means father. Which is easier than the one the Rab. Rab. Rab is harder than Ab. But he's Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah. Rab. He is the Lord, cherisher, sustainer, evolver of mankind. Rab. 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 No Ab. What's wrong with it? I say it's a beautiful expression. Beautiful. Then why did Muhammad choose or Allah made him not to have the word Ab inside? When it's easier on the child than Rab. Because this word Father, Ab, has other connotations. You might have certain misunderstandings. Which the Christian is going out of his way to emphasize. He says in his catechism, the Anglican, the Methodist, the Presbyterian, the Lutheran, all of them, the Roman Catholic, they all in the catechism. You know what's catechism? The Shahada. In the book of Shahada, what were they supposed to believe? Like what we are supposed to believe. Amantu billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi. Like, that's catechism. Their catechism, in that they say, Jesus is the only begotten son. Begotten, not made. This is the, in every catechism. There are books of Shahada. They say Jesus is the only begotten Son. Begotten, not made. Now that's shh. Allah is abhorred. What are you saying? He reacts in the Holy Quran. He cries. Our Akida is we can't use such terms. But I can't help it. I don't know what other words I can tell you to express to you his horror. That's what they are saying. He says, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَنُ وَلَدَا And they say that Ar-Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten a son. سَلَقَدُ جِئْتُمْ شَيْئًا إِدَّا It's one of the most abominable assertions one can make. The worst swearing you can give Allah is this. Any one of you start giving me a little trouble at question time, I might get angry with you. And in my anger I said, go oh, man, you're a fool. What do you do? Will you punch me? No, I said, the old man is tired, you know. Old people have a tendency to get angry quickly. 
like an old man like me, he went to the hak Hakim, Hakim the doctor. He says, Hakim Sahab, he says, you know, I can see very, very clearly. So the Hakim says, you see, you are old now. It's a sign of old age. You saw me putting on the specs. He said, it's a sign of old age. He said, you know, Hakim Sahab, I can't hear properly. He says, it's a sign of old age. He said, you know, Hakim Sahab, my bones are creaking. It's a sign of old age. And the old man lost his temper and slapped him on the face. So he said, this is also a sign of old age. So I, I can get angry with you. You have to excuse me. You see, I'm big and strong, people want to, because I, I sound like that, like a young boxer, and everybody wants to box with me, because I sound like that. I said, look, I sound like that, but I'm an old man. So in my anger, I said, you're a fool, man, go, sit down. What you do? You laugh it off. I said, you go, you're an ox, bell, hey, bell, ox. What you do? You laugh it off. I said, go, you're a donkey. I said, you're a monkey. What do you do? You laugh it off. But if I said something about your mother, what do you say now? I said, uncle, I don't want to hear one more word from you. Look, all my respect for you will be gone. Actually, it's already gone. But I will... Why? We love your mother, we love our daughters, we love our sisters, we love our wives. Leave them out. Call me what you like, call me donkey, call me monkey, call me fool, call me what you like, but don't take my mother's name. Don't take my wife's name, not my sister's, not my daughter's name. You understand? I say, yes, I understand. Allah says, the worst feeling you can give him is this. He said, Takadu samawatu yatafattarna minhu. It is the skies are ready to burst. Watan shakta al ardu and the earth to split asunder. Wata khirru jibalu hadda and the mountains to fall down in utter ruin. Anda awli rahmani walada. That they should say that Ar Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten his son. If the heavens are feeling like you, if the earth has feeling and emotions like you, if the mountains are feeling and emotions like you, they all would have been shattered to pieces. Such a horrible swearing they give Allah. I want to know whether we react. Any Muslim anywhere in the world, whether you are a Pakistani or Pakistani or Saudi or Kuwaiti or Bangladeshi or Mauritians, what are you? Whatever. I'm talking about the learned man. Because the bulk of us, we don't know about these verses in the Quran that Allah is crying. You don't know. The learned man knows. Does he move? Is he moved? No, he's not moved. Why? It's a joke. When the Christians say, Jesus is the only begotten son, begotten not made. What do you do? <laughs> is that what you do when you go home now? And your mother tells you, you know, the guy next door, he was swearing me like this. I don't want to use the words, but what he could be swearing your mother or your wife or your daughter. What do you do? You have a good meal. You go to sleep. I shall silence him for good. I'll break his jaw. And if I can't do it, I'll hire a gang. No man cost me a thousand pounds. That's much how much we love our mothers, our wives, our sisters, our daughters. But we say our claim is we love Allah more than anything else. And when they say things to him, what do you do? If I call you monkeys and bonkeys, am I not justified? Huh? What do you do? Nothing. You laugh. Big joke. Is that a joke? So Allah says, you look out. Fatara Basu, you wait for your destruction. And we are waiting. No, my dear brothers, you don't go and bash the fellow on the head. You don't strangle him. You don't put a knife to him. But talk to him. And you know, it's so easy to talk to the English-speaking people. So easy, unbelievably easy. We are foreigners. He can see it in your faces. You can never become an Englishman. You, Bengali will be Bengali and you, <laughs> Hindi will be Hindi. And you, Mauritian will be Mauritian. You can never be a, a white man. You'll never be. No matter how you speak, you sound like a white man, but once they see you, I know where you come from. Your origin, I know. You can't bluff him. But so use that. That weakness of ours is a strength. Every white man you meet, the Christian, who says this, that Jesus is the only begotten son. Talk to him. He says, sir, will you please explain to me? I don't understand English. Tell me when you say begotten, not made. 
What are you trying to emphasize? Can you ask a question like that? Simple. When you say begotten, not made, what are you really trying to tell me? That's all. Please explain. I don't understand your language. And believe me, no English man born can over open his mouth. You have delivered the message. You don't have to shout at him, you don't have to strangle him, you say, you know, you're swearing my Allah. No, no, no. Talk to him. Invite all to the ways of the Lord with wisdom. Well, now is it and with beautiful preaching. So I've been asking this question to Britishers. Nobody opens his mouth. And the Americans, and one American had the guts. It was on an occasion I was guiding him around the mosque on a mosque tour. And somehow we came across this topic. So I'm asking him that when you say, begotten, not made, what are you trying to emphasize? What does it mean? So he said, it means sired by God. So what? He said, no, I didn't say that. I'm only telling you that what it means, means sired by God. Exactly. That's why Allah rewards. Angered. Abbas. And the way to rectify it. Talk, talk, talk. So get this, some of these little books of mine. So for 23 years, this word, Father, never in this book. It's a good word, but it has other connotations. He is the Father of Jesus Christ. He begot Mary. Through Mary, He begot His Son. Because begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex. Are you attributing such a quality to God? He says, no. Then why are you saying it? Words, if they have any meaning, in every language they have meaning. What does it mean? I'd like to give you a crude example. One of you young men here. You, my son, you stand up at the right at the end. You, 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 yes. With the, you were the Qari. MashaAllah, stand up. You were the Qari, MashaAllah. My son, if I were to call you my son, you mind it? No, he doesn't mind. You think your father or mother would mind it? No. See, it's out of love and feeling. He's like a son to me. He thinks I'm like an uncle, grandfather. Mm, okay. I call him a son. He call me chacha, dada, nana. Okay. <laughs> but if I take you for a visit to his house, maybe I know him more intimately than you think. And I take you, say, look, there's a friend of mine living here. And um, we'll have tea there. And we go to his house. And I'm asking, where is Yusuf, my son? That's his name, for example. Yusuf, my son. So his master tells me, look, he's just gone to the shop, he'll come back just now. I said, right, okay. And Yusuf comes, and I embrace him, my son. My companion, who doesn't know our relationship, is asking me, is he really your son? I says, no. You see, this young man loves me like a father, like a grandfather. I call him a son, and he calls me Nana Dada. Okay. But instead, if I said, yes, he is my begotten son, sit down. The meaning changes. The meaning changes. He is my begotten son. You know what I'm saying? In the ordinary street language, you know what I'm saying? That is a bastard. <laughs> I'm swearing him in a beautiful way. He is my begotten son. I said, he's my only begotten son. Worse. I'm swearing he's a bastard, you know, he's a bastard of the highest order. But I said, he's my only begotten child. And if he catches the joke, his uncle, what did you say? I said, no, I don't mean that. But I'm still telling, doesn't he look like my Yusuf at home? What am I saying? What am I saying? <laughs> Astaghfirullah. So, my dear brothers and sisters, Mr. Chairman, and I feel like keeping you here much longer, but I don't think I would. I would rather give you a chance to ask questions. Things that you might want to know further about the Quran, or how you handle different problems when you are confronted with the unbeliever, is arguing and debating with you. I said, you had did your best, but you were not satisfied with your best. How would Uncle Dida do such and thing? How would he answer it? Maybe I might have a better way, or maybe I'll learn from you. So with these words, I say, Mr. Chairman, and my dear brothers and sisters, Jazakallahu fi darain. Invited a very stern disciplinarian, uh, <coughs> Mr. Ibrahim Lokat, who will explain to you the format of the question and answer session. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. 
I hope you don't take the cue from the chairman and actually believe that I am a stern discipli disciplinarian, excuse me for that, but I'll be firm and fair. Before I go into the format, I just want to thank once again the Leighton Society and the IPCI London for inviting Sheikh Ahmed Didat and myself from South Africa to come and talk to you here this evening. It really is wonderful to see our brethren because we are very close in South Africa to the Mauritian community. We go there for holidays, they come to us for holidays, they marry our sisters sometime. Uh, so we are very close to the Mauritian and it's good to see that the, that the little dot in the Indian Ocean Island is starting to make a comma here in England, alhamdulillah. As far as the format that goes for the question time tonight, I want to draw your attention to the following points. We are going to handle it in this manner. I am going to ask, after I've explained the format, for all the people desirous of posing a question to the speaker to form a queue here in the front. It's very difficult to look at the show of hands, so we will ask you to form a queue at the front. Not now, when I have finished explaining the format to you. Secondly, I would draw your attention to the fact that the questions must be confined to the subject of the lecture delivered tonight. I think it is only fair with an audience of this size, as the chairman pointed out, we could be here all night if we have an open agenda, so kindly confine your questions to the topic of the lecture. Thirdly, I would like to point out that I will disqualify statements. It's question time, not statements time. I'm aware that there are some of us that will try and sneak a statement in, in the guise of a question. Well, good luck if you get past me, but I will disqualify it because it is question time. I must also tell you that I will allow one question per questioner. If you have more than one question, it will only be fair if I ask you to go again to the back of the queue. So it's one question at a time, please. As far as the questions are concerned, if you would give your question to me, I would like to repeat it for the audience because they may not be able to hear you. Then Sheikh Didat will answer the question. So all questions will be put through, through me, please. Finally, it is a reality that not everybody will be able to get their questions answered with the sheer numbers. And it's also a reality that not every question will elicit the answer that you may hope, because you only need two people to have a difference of opinion. It only needs two people. People have different perceptions. It reminds me of a story where two people are in a prison. They say one looked out, saw the stars, the other looked out and saw the ground. Same prison, same cell, same window, both looking out, both see different points of views. We're not out here to canvas your vote tonight, to ask you to agree with everything that Brother Didat says, so there will be variances of opinions, and that's healthy. So with that, having explained the rules through to you, I would now like to throw it open to question time. Will all those that have questions please form a queue here before we proceed? Okay, brothers, we'll be on our way in a minute. Mamu, I would like you to, the gentleman that's there, we will be cutting off there. Anybody else joining the queue, we will, not be, we will not take their questions after that. So will you please join the queue? Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum sister, your question please. Shall I read it out? Yes. yes. Well, what I'm interested in is the Trinitarian concept that is in the Bible and like you said in John 3.16, God shall love the woman, he will follow the son. I have been to Christian University for the last four years and study Christian courses, but nobody, none of my professors was able to tell me where this concept originates in history. You have studied comparative religion. Would you be able to tell me in history where it originates? Is, is it a creation of Paul? Is it a creation of Paul in accordance to Rome? Or, you know, my professors wouldn't or couldn't tell me, and I would like to know that. Okay, I will repeat the question as briefly as I can, and very briefly is the lady poses to shake thee that where did the concept of Trinitarian emerge? Because she has not been able to 
find the answers uh, from other sources. Where did the concept of Trinitarian emerge? Trinity has been in vogue with the Egyptians. It has been in vogue with the Hindus, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. It has been in vogue with the pagan cults. But now how did it get into Christianity? Jesus Christ, he never preached Trinity at any time. We read in the Gospel of St. Mark, I think chapter 12, verse 29, that a learned man of the Jew comes to Jesus and says, Master, in the Hebrew language, Rabbi, Maulana, Sheikh Sahib, what commandment is the first of all? The Awwal Kalima. What is it? And Jesus answers and says unto him, in the Hebrew language, says, Shama Israelu Adonai Elohainu Adonai Echad, which means, Hear, o Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. If he had come to preach Trinity, that was the time to tell them, tell the man that for the three that may record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. He said nothing of the kind. But the verse that I just said, that I uttered, is in the Christian Bible. In the Roman Catholic version of the Bible, it's there. In the authorized King James version of the Bible, it's there. It is in the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7. First epistle of John is called 1 John 5, 7. It's there. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That is the closest approximation to what the Christians call the Holy Trinity. But if you take up any modern Bible today, any modern translation, the Revised Version, the Revised Standard Version, the American Standard Version, the New International Version, and any Bible that you take up today, this verse is thrown out as a fabrication. By the Christians, not by the Muslims. The Holy Quran tells us to tell them, Wala taqulu thalasa. Don't say Trinity. In tahu khairul lakum. This is, stop it, it will be better for you. Innam Allahu ilahu wahid. For you Allah is one Allah. He's not three in one. And now as if, hearkening to that command, the Christians have thrown it out as a fabrication because it is a fabrication. Because in the most ancient manuscripts that Christians have, this verse was not there. It entered into Christendom for the first time in the 6th century. A certain vigilance of Thapsus. He made a marginal note on his manuscripts for his own edification or maybe for his children. But this marginal note, when they came across that manuscript, when they wanted to print it, the marginal note became a part of the text. Now they discovered that this is, they had no right to do that. This is the fabrication, interpolation. So as such, as sincere people, they threw it out. But the doctrine they can't let go. Because if they do, automatically they are Muslims. So this is the thing that's holding them back. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. It was first invented in the, in the year 325, under Constantine. And then let's call it the Nicene Creed. This is how they formulated it. That the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. But they are not three gods, but one God. The Catechism, the Nicene Creed, it continues. The Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, and the Holy Ghost is Almighty. But they are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. It continues. The Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. But they are not three persons, but one person. Now, you see, we all get bamboozled. This is not our language. English is a foreign language. No matter how much you are an expert, it's still foreign to you. So we think maybe it makes sense to the Britisher, to the English-speaking person. Person, 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 but not three person, but one person. Is that English? I'm asking him because I seem to know that this is not English. Although I'm not so educated, but I know this is not English. I said, is that English? He said, yes. I said, don't be silly. This is gibberish. You said, person, person, person. But not three person, but one person. What language is that? That's gibberish. That's not English. What is a person? I said, please explain to me in your language. What is a person? He said, this is how simple it is to knock the giant. Ask him in humility, please explain to me what is a person. 
If you and your two other brothers are identical triplets, I can't make out the difference between the three of you. Identical. If you commit murder, can I hang the other? Can we hang the other? Why not? He says, no. I said, why not? He said, no, he's a different person. What makes him a different person? Is his personality. Right. So the father, his personality, when you say the father, are you thinking of the son? He says, no. When you say the son, are you thinking of the Holy Ghost? You say, no, unless your mind is diseased. <laughs> so the father is a different picture. The son is a different picture in your mind. The Holy Ghost is a different picture. These are three distinct pictures. And you can never superimpose these three and create one. You see me, my father's photo, if I take a negative, my picture take a negative, and my son's picture take a negative, when we superimpose, we can create a common picture, which will look like my father, will look like me, and look my, like my son. But when you take the father, the son, and the Holy Ghost, you can never create a picture. Father is different. The way Father Christmas sitting in heaven with his feet dangling on the earth as his footstool, the loving Father in heaven, billions of times bigger than man by something like that. When you say, God the Son, I say, why do you think of a prize bull or a false wacher? No, do you think of a handsome young man? Like we saw in the King of Kings, Jeffrey Hunter was acting with blue eyes, blonde hair. You know? He says, you're thinking of a man. When you say the Holy Ghost, I say you're thinking like something that came like a dove when Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan or something that came in flames of fire at Pentecost. The picture is not very vivid, but the picture is there. He said, yes. Now, merge them into one. Never. But I ask you, be honest, I'm asking the Christian. Tell me, how many pictures do you see? He says, one. I say, you are lying. I can't take them out and show it to the world. I said, look, you got three inside there. But however, that's all philosophical. Next question, please. Next one. Check it out this set of many occasions. There's only one version out of the Quran. Now, um, some of our Sunni brothers, they have published a booklet uh, accusing our Shia brothers that they have uh, a different Quran, one chapter added, and entitled Suratul Wilaya, and they've given a photocopy. Could you please uh, comment on that? There is only one Quran, still. If a person chooses to add anything, you can't hold his hands. Whether he's a Christian or a Muslim or a whatever, whoever he is. If he chooses, look, you see, this thing is missing. I say, in from which book? When was it taken out? Because every Quran we come across in the world, we go to China, the oldest one you can lay your hands on, you go to Indonesia, go to India, anywhere in the world, there are no two Qurans, the Arabic Quran. I'm not talking about translations. In translations, you have a choice of words. You know how one feels that he can convey the message better than the other. There is a difference of choice of words. But there is no such thing as a version. If you know what a version is, the Christian version, Roman, the dual version, seven books more than the Protestant version. That makes a version. Seven more books, these people threw it out, different version. Revised standard version, so many verses thrown out as a fabrication, that's a version. In the Quran, all the Qurans in the world that I know, I'm 74 now, and my father and my grandfathers, we know there is only one version of the Quran, of the Arabic Quran. If people choose to say this and that, we have a right to question them. Where did you get that from? When was it taken out and who took it out? Ah, that verse that you say, for example, was supposed to be in the Quran, who took it out? Did Hazrat Ali take it out? Did Hazrat Umar or Osman or Abu Bakr, who took it out? When? We want proof of that. So the thing is, there is only one Quran, the Arabic Quran, no two versions. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thanks a lot for the lecture. Uh, the question is, which remains in my mind, is not the miracle of the Holy Quran, because you've just confirmed that, and uh, many other thinkers and writers and even scientists have done so. But uh, the question is, on how can we convince the politicians of the super superpower of G7 now, and uh, and even the politician of the Muslims country, yeah? which obviously they are not ruling according to Quranic teaching, neither do they behave according to it, yeah? So please could you reply to the answer? The only way I know is 
like our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam he did. What did he do? He was surrounded by the superpowers of his day, the Persian Empire, the Roman Empire. He was surrounded by mushriks, mushriks of Mecca. He was surrounded by Jews. He was surrounded by Christians. He was surrounded by munafiks, hypocrites. How did he convey the message to them? Same manner. In other words, the problem with us is, with us, when I say we as Muslims, all of us, we haven't done our job. For a thousand years, we haven't opened our mouths. We haven't spoken to the Jews or the Christians. Allah Ta'ala is addressing the Jews and the Christians. In the Quran, again and again, Ya Halal Kitab, Ya Halal Kitab, O people of the book, O people of the book, I ask anybody, any learned person among the Muslims, who is Ahlul Kitab? Is a Jews and Christians. Ya Bani Israel, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, O children of Israel, who are children of Israel? You? No, he said the Jews. Now this message that Allah gave you, we are the postmen. Allah's postmen. One third of the Quran is addressed to Jews and Christians. You won't deliver the message. You have done exactly the same what the Jews did. They made their religion a racial religion. We don't make it our religion racial. But somehow we are not prepared to deliver the message. You are only a postman. I'm only a postman. Have you delivered that message? Answer is no. Have you delivered the message to the Muslims? I give you an example. That Allah is crying from high heaven. What these people are doing to me, what they are saying about me. Does any Muslim react? That's what I told you. Nobody reacts. You know why? Because they're not really reading it. You read, actually you rattle it off. We call it Khatmul Quran. Finishing the Quran. Ask any Muslim. My people. How many Khatams you did last Ramadan? He said, I did one. My, my wife did five. My mother did ten. What? Khatam. What is Khatam? Finishing. <laughs> I'm telling that this Quran is not for finishing. This Quran is there, is to be implemented. What you read, you understand, you go and implement it. Allah is telling you to call the Jews and the Christians. Call Ya Ahlul Kitab Ta'ala. And I'm asking, Wallah, I'm asking. I asked the learned men of Egypt. I'm asking the people in Arabia, in the Arab countries. I'm asking them, you read the Quran? He said, yes. I said, you understand the Quran? He said, of course. You know what, like you Hindis, that's me, my nation. It's not like you Hindis, you rattle it off, you don't know what you read. I said, accept it. I won't go into pros and cons, what happened and how? That we have reached this stage, that we, are, we can recite the Quran, Hafiz al-Quran, Qari, and we don't know a word what we are saying. How that system came about is a long story. But the fact is, you understand the Quran. He said, yes. I said, so now Allah is telling you. He's telling everybody. We are all responsible. But most especially you, because you understand. You understand what the message is. So Allah says, Ya Ahlul Kitab, Qul Ya Ahlul Kitab, Say, O people of the book, La taqlu fi dinikum. He says, do not go to extremes in your religion. Did you tell them that? And the guy says, no. I'm talking about the learned man now. He says, no. So Allah is telling you. Lagat kafar al-lazina qalu inna Allah wa masih ibn Maryam. Say, anyone who says that Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, is God, is making kufar, is an act of blasphemy, treason against Allah. Wa qal al-masih. But Christ said, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, la'abudu Allah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, who is my Lord and your Lord. Inna hu man yushrik billah, whoever will associate anyone with Allah, faqad haram Allah liya jannah, Allah will make jannah haram for them. Wa ma'wahu nar, and the fire of hell will be the dwelling place. Wa ma'al al-zalimin min ansar, and for the wrong ways there will be no one to help. Did you tell them that? He says, no. I'm talking about the learned men among the Arabs now. Forget the Hindi. Hindi, Chindi, in Mauritian, and Bangladeshi, forget them. Indonesian, forget them. Nigerians, Ghanaians, forget them. I'm talking about the Arab, I'm telling the Arab, I'm asking him. I said, Allah is telling you to tell them, وَلَا تَكُولُوا ثَلَاسَ Don't say, Trinity, إِن تَهُوا خَيْرَ لَكُمْ This is stop it, it will be better for you. إِنَّمَ اللَّهُ وَلَا وَاحِدْ For you, Allah is one Allah. Did you tell them that? He says, no. So Allah is telling you, قُلْ Tell them, يَا أَحْلَ الْكِتَابِ O people of the book, تَعَالَ I say, you understand? تَعَالَ You know what it means? Come. Allah is telling you, call them. Did you call them? 
He says, no. This is the sickness. We haven't done the job for a thousand years. So we lost the art. Once you stop doing anything, your muscles, you have done exercise and for five years, ten years, you don't know, they all become flabby and start getting lost. Anything. Anything that you don't exercise, your brains, you don't, you, don't start, you don't think, you don't think, you become like a vegetable, cabbage. You become a piece of cabbage. This is the law of nature, law of God. You have to be always on the go, on the ball. Once you are on the ball, you remain on top. You allow yourself to get into this rut, this is the destiny. So the thing to do is, to our Muslim brothers, I am telling you, I said, go to the Qur'an. Read it with understanding and apply what you read, what you understand, go and apply it. And share this. Share this with your fellow countrymen, with the G7 or G10 or whatever it is. Go and share it with them. To the Americans, to the British, French, German. I said, go and deliver the message, man. You haven't done it. So this will be our eternal situation, what we find now. No difference. You can't change. If you want to change, you have to become militant. You want to share. And once you want to share, you'll find ways and means. How can I share? How can I make the person to listen to me? And inshallah, we'll do the job. Because this is the destiny of Islam. Allah says, He it is who has sent his messenger with guidance, with din al-haq, and with the religion of truth, that it may prevail, overcome and supersede every other deen, every other way of life, every ideology, whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, Communism, Zoroastrianism, whatever ism, Allah is destined to master them all, bulldoze them all. Allah says, never mind how much the mushrik might not like it. This is the destiny of his deen. I'm asking my brothers and sisters here, do you believe in that? I want to hear, I want to hear from you. Do you believe in that? Yes. Yes. A little louder so that I think can be recorded your voice. Do you believe in it? Yes. 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 Masha, masha. This is what the Arabs say, say. I have spoken to the Arabs. The Saudis, the Egyptians, the Kuwaitis, the Bahrainis, same response. If you say you don't, you are not a Muslim, you are a Kafir. I'm not worried about you, you can go to hell, I don't care. Everybody says yes, and loudly so. I said, no, that means you believe in it, they say yes. I said, is that why you sit on your backside doing nothing? <laughs> if you believe this, you got the laser gun, you behave like this. You have your sons and daughters, our brothers breaking up the bones, the Jews are breaking up their bones in, in Palestine. You just sit like this, like a jellyfish. No. The reason is you don't really believe. If you really believe, you'll move in that direction. So the thing is, my dear brother, my son, go to the Quran. Allow Allah to talk to you and to me and to every passerby in the street. Because Allah is speaking to you, to me and to every passerby in the street. And we have the advantage that our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he needed Akhi Jibreel to bring him messages. Without Jibreel, you have the message now. Direct contact with Allah's kalam. Listen to him and go and implement it. And inshallah, G7 or G14, we will be able to do the job. It's left to you. The onus is on you and me and every one of us. Yes, my son. As the subject is on miracles, from previous lectures, I've, meant to, uh, I've understood that the Christians, fundamental, among the most fundamental issues in believing that Jesus was God, is because of the weird miracles he was going to One of the greatest miracles was when he was led back to life. We are made to believe that, and we are made to believe the Old Testament also. In that case, what about when Moses threw his staff and he turned into a serpent? Is that a great miracle? Or is bringing a, a dead man back to life a great miracle? Yes, the logic is very good, beautiful. You see, Jesus gave life to the dead. The Quran says, Biznillah, by Allah's help. The Bible says the very same thing, that he didn't give life to the dead. If you read the verses, you see, we can go into the details and analyze the miracles, but in the Bible also, Jesus doesn't say he does the works. He said, I, by the finger of God, cast out devils. I, by the Spirit of God, do these things. So I, of my own self, can do nothing. 
Who does it? It is you who does the work. Allah is doing working through him. So he disowns giving life to the dead. Or oh, any miracle. Everything says, Allah, you are doing it. You are doing it. It's not me. But the Christians say, he gave life to the dead. They say, all right, for a moment again. We agree with him. So in that case, we say it's a great miracle. Lazarus, they say, after three days he was revived from the dead. Fantastic. But as, now, as you mentioned, you reminded me that Hazrat Musa a.s. The miracle Allah gave him, through him, was that he was told that the Asad, the rod, go before Pharaoh and you go and throw it. And it will become a serpent, a snake. And this serpent that Hazrat Musa a.s. through the rod became a serpent and it swallowed up all the little snakes of the Egyptians, which were the little magic wands. And when it was swallowed up and Musa a.s. picked up the rod, all those little rods or snakes had vanished. And the Egyptian magicians realized that this is not magic. Magic is a type of illusion you create. People think you did this and you did that, maybe a sleight of hand, quickness of hand, this is the eye. All these things can happen. We don't know what, what the guy does. But we are marveling because we couldn't account for what, what he did. But the Egyptian magician, when we read the Quran, they confessed that this is not magic. Because magic would be you are mesmerized, somebody demesmerizes you. Back again to normal, the sticks become sticks, no more snakes, and the rod becomes rod. But no, all the little sticks had vanished. Where did they go? And the rod is still the same. So giving life to the rod, which is an inanimate thing, a dead wood. It's a greater miracle. A dead piece of wood bringing, I said, a man dies, certified dead, to bring him back to life is a miracle. But is not as astonishing as you take a piece, this pen here, my pen. If I can make this into a little snake, that will be greater if genuinely, if I can make this into a snake, and you feel it, and you can feel that man, this is, you let it go, and somebody else picks it up and he lets it go, he says, no, this is genuine. This is a little tiny serpent. This will be greater than giving life to the dead, because this is dead, dead, dead. The rod is dead, dead, dead. And you make it animate. First, dead vegetable, the rod. The rod is a dead piece of wood, vegetable. He gives life to that and makes it into an animate object, a snake. Still great a miracle. So if this miracle is the standard by judging, then Moses would be a greater God than Jesus. If you analyze and weigh the miracles. Thank you for your question. Uh, in order to understand the meaning of Quran, is it necessary to learn Arab language? There is nothing better than to understand the Quran in the language in which Allah had revealed. Translation is a translation. It can never be equal to the Arabic Quran because this is Allah's Kalam, His words. And they have meaning and a feeling which you can't produce in a translation. But we are hungry people. You are hungry, you want biryani, biryani. If you can't get biryani, what do you do? He said, doll and rice will do. <laughs> you know, simple doll, rice, it's a, a crumb of bread and some doll will do to assuage your hunger. So, the translation is just that. But in the meantime, if you strict yourself, no, you must learn the Arabic language before you approach the Quran, you might never come to that. Therefore, the second best is a translation. And if you understand Urdu better than any other language, you get an Urdu translation. If you understand Bengali better than any other language, get a Bengali translation. If you understand Gujarati better than any other language, get a Gujarati translation. They are all available. But in this environment, I said an English translation is imperative. And the cheapest and the best and the most organized is this one I am showing you. This one here. By Abdullah Yusuf Ali. They are available outside. As well as all my little booklets that I have written. Christ in Islam. This is the Bible God's word and all that. There are any two for a pound. Any two for a pound. Or 50 pence each. And again, I assure you, no commission for me. Except with Allah. Thank you. I want to thank God for a person like uh, Sheikh Bidat among us. And on that basis also I know that Sheikh Bidat does not need much for questions. He is always explaining very well. I have seen his uh, tapes and I have seen read his booklets. Only thing what I have found uh, one little thing which I want is rather a suggestion that he has never touched upon the fact that this is a book which is 
done by heart by more people than ever in the world. And it is really a miracle to me. And would you like to uh, say something mm. about that? That was a statement, but we'll allow it. Yes, my dear brothers, you see, look, as I said, there are so many things I can keep you here till midnight, just on the subject of Al-Quran, the miracle of miracles, but everything, even good things, there is an end to that. This, uh, this idea, or this fact, that we have so many hufas, at the moment there are four million hafiz al-Qurans in the world. Somebody estimated four million people who know the whole Quran by heart. From one end to the other, they can read it off. And the greater miracle of that is that bulk of the people who know the Quran by heart, they don't understand one word. There's no other language on earth that you can rattle off a language without understanding what you're saying. And they say it beautifully, perfectly. So this is still a greater miracle, but I'm not very proud of it. Of that miracle, I'm not very proud. I says, brothers and sisters, you ought to know what you are reading. Make an effort. You read it in Arabic, get a translation, and try and correlate, correlate. And over a period, passively, you learn the language. Or at least the Quranic words. That whenever you hear, Ya Yuhallazina Amanu, you keep on, Ya Yuhal, O you who believe, Ya Yuhallazina Amanu, O you who believe. Over a period, when the Imam is dealing with khutbahs, Ya Yuhallazina Amanu, Taqullah Haqqa Tuqatihi, Wala Tamutunna, you will be able to catch. At least here, there, there. And it will be more lively and more spiritually enlightening, elevating than just listening to the sound of the Quran. Yes, man. My dear brothers and sisters, in this Quran, I take it you have a translation, Yusuf Ali's. You have, mashallah. You open up. You open up the index, go to the index, and you find there hereafter. You find there the day of judgment. There are more than 100 references about the day of judgment and about the life hereafter. Now, you do a little bit of homework, go through those, and inshallah you may be able to come along and inform us. In other words, now I, have to, I haven't done a study of that. I must confess. It's there, but I haven't had the chance of coming to it yet. So now I'm going to start fumbling and guessing, trying to grapple this and grapple that or start opening and reading now, which is impossible for me to start reading and start expounding to you. It's a lecture and another lecture and another lecture. Right? But I give you that little homework to do. You go along and look up the day of judgment, judgment in the index and you look up hereafter in the index and you just go through that inshallah by the time you finish you will be able to deliver a lecture on that signs of the of the coming of the hour of judgment Allah challenges mankind to produce a surah like the Quran and but is this challenge to be taken as a literal challenge to challenge the literature of the Quran or does it connote a deeper challenge which the ordinary Muslims cannot see and if someone is to respond to that challenge, on what criteria can we judge or who can judge whether that challenge or the response by a non-Muslim is at the level of the Qur'an? Thank you. In the first instance, this challenge was addressed to the other Arabs, the Quraysh of his time. What did they understand? What did they understand? When it's so obvious this man is an ummi unlearned. And there are people like Abu Jahl, one of the most learned men among the Arabs of his time, Abu Sufyan, and the like, and they were poets among the Arabs in the time of the Prophet. What did they understand by the challenge? Whatever they understood, that challenge they couldn't meet. It was their language, and they were quite proficient from the material point of view, educational point of view, more qualified than our Nabi Karim sallallahu So what was it that stumped them? The very sound, the music, the rhythm of the Qur'an, just forget the sense for a time. Just the mere construction of sentences of the Qur'an. They are in themselves are overpowering, that the Christian world has not been able to produce one, the Arab world. Now when they bring it, he says, let's hear. 
They have made an attempt. You see, to my Arab audiences, I give them. This is what they have done. 16 year project, the Christians have carried out. And they produced the New Testament. I think I left it behind in, the, in my hotel. I left it behind because I didn't imagine anybody would be asking me. I had the book there, produced by the Christians, a New Testament, according to the Fasih and Balik of the Quran. Trying to, and I have made Arabs to read it. So come, come. I want you to read it to your audience. Arabs reading to other Arabs. They start, every chapter now begins of this New Testament with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So come and read it. As you have the Samad Abdul Basit. Come and read it. You know, sir. Bismillah, whatever you do. Any objection? You can't. This is the verse from the Holy Quran. They have, now, to challenge the Quran, they produce an ayah from the Quran as the beginning. And every chapter, they say Galili or. Magdasi, we say Makki, Makkiya, Madaniya, so they give the same style. And the designs also Quranic. And you start reading. And the Arab has a laugh of his lifetime. Because he knows that the silliest type of, con they only bring the phrases on the Quran and fit it in somewhere, somewhere here, somewhere there, to the un 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 untutored people like us, the Hindi Muslim, and the Bangladeshi, and the Indonesian, and the African Muslim, to them, they don't know the difference between grass and saffron. Like we, we don't really know. So now, we might not be able to catch the joke because it starts with Bismillah. And if it's beautifully said, no objection. And the words from the Quran here and there, I said, now, but the qualified people, the ordinary man is able to see the joke. And the biggest joke that the Christians have produced is this translation, which they say it is something like the Quran, by copying words and phrases. But on the obvious, on the face of it, on the face of it, this challenge has not been met yet, on the face of it. We, once they produce that, then say, let's start analyzing it. And inshallah, you will be able to do that yourself. You won't need an alim to do it, you will be able to do it, inshallah. I come from a faithful family, and alhamdulillah, I do believe that Al-Quran, the miracle of miracles, is true. Uh, sometimes I find it difficult when questions posed at me. Uh, which is from Quran Sharia. And on a number of occasions I've been asked, I don't know the precise verses from Quran, but I believe there is one or two verses which says there are five things which a human being cannot tell, like when it's going to rain, when uh, a person will die, where the food will come from, and what's the baby, a baby in a mummy's womb. Uh, now, with the contrasting remarks or contrasting results from research and so things, uh, there are answers sometimes contradictory, <coughs> which appears contradictory. How do I respond to those? My dear brother, there is one advantage we have with this translation. I have found again and again, somebody poses a, a problem for you. That the Quranic ayah, such and such, he gives you a translation. And which, according to our understanding, we can't seem to get it reconciled, according to our limited understanding. You have a problem for yourself now. What you do, you go to Yusuf Ali's translation, and invariably you find the man is explaining it to you, as if he knew beforehand that this will be the sickness of the man in the 1990s and in the 20th century, as if he knew beforehand. This is what I have discovered so far. What our problem? Something like what you're talking now. Open the book. Open the verse. Like suppose you give me reference, I would have done it, this exercise now. While you are sitting there. So let's see now what it says. Look at the commentary. His commentary is most comprehensive commentary. And most modern according to our thinking. And he seems to answer. The rest is, you go to the scholars. I'm not a scholar. I am an expert in the field of comparative religion. In that field, I think, you know, I am a master. About the rest of the Quran, I see the beauties, I share with you, and I haven't got the answers to all of anybody's questions. I haven't. 
Quran Not fatwa, this is a man who has really studied the Quran. Okay, I mean, the right. So somebody who's more learned. I'm not a really learned man. I said I'm an expert in this art of comparative religion. I think I'm an expert, you see. But all knowledge about Islam and the Quran, I can tell you I haven't got it. So find a you know, person who is more qualified and go to the commentary and inshallah you'll get the answer there. The question that most of the non-Muslims ask is that the non-Muslims is the question that asks that there is no continuity. One incident that's been described in one session finishes after the The question that the sister has been asked by certain non-Muslims is that it appears that there is no continuity in the Quranic chapters, that a chapter finishes and stops and a new topic starts with the next chapter. Is that, is that the question, sister? Jazakar. Now we must confess that the Quran is not a storybook. This is a unique book. The preservation, the substance, uh, the message, everything is unique about this book. You see, every other religious scripture, every other, whether it's the Bhagavad Gita, or the Ramayana of the Hindus, or the Holy Bible of the Christians, you open the book and it's telling you a story. And if I tell you a story, you'll never forget in your lifetime. I just read it to you, verses from the Bible, once I read it to you, in a hundred years you can't forget that Uncle D, that if you live to a hundred, he said there was an old man came from South Africa and he read some verses of the Bible and that those verses are, you might not be able to reproduce the words, but the whole picture you'll be able to reproduce. You know why? Because it's a story on the basis of once upon a time. And we all remember stories, Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamb. You remember what Sinbad the sailor. You remember what Ali Baba and the 40 thieves. You can't forget them. Once the story is told and you visualize the pictures, the scenes, they remain with you for a lifetime. The Quran is not like that. The Quran had come in answer to a problem, to a solution to a problem. Warnings, this, that, and it ends there. It doesn't start like the birth of the Quran. In the whole Quran, you do not find the name of our Nabi's father. You will not find his mother's name. You will not find the name of his wife. You will not find the name of his dear daughter Fatima. Am I right? You will not find Abu Bakr here. You will not find Umar there. You will not find Osman. You won't find Ali. Isn't this amazing? For 23 years the people are around him and the names are not here. No, no mention at all. So now because the person is used to fairy tales, once upon a time, the fox and the grapes, the wolf and the lamb, he is expecting to find the same type of thing here. It is not. Allah Baritala speaks. And when he speaks, he speaks by telegrams. It's not like this, like that. Like, he doesn't talk like this. هو الله أحد Say he is Allah the one and only. Allah Samad, God the eternal, absolute. لم يلد ولم يولد He does not beget and is not begotten. ولم يكن له كفا أحد And there's nothing like unto him. Finish, full stop. Now, grapple with it. Difficult. Ask what did I say? What did I say? He said, well you said there's one, one, only one Allah, one God I say. What else? He said, well, he's got no father, no son, as yes. What else? Finish. Why? This is not a storybook. You read the Bible or any other book, I said, I'll give you an example. While he, Genesis chapter 38, while he, Judah, Judah, the father of the Jewish race, was going to Timnat to share his sheep. You don't have to remember the names. He sees a woman sitting by the roadside. I'm, let me read. Is there any Christian who would like to read it? Some Christians, why do they read it? Because they think I might be shooting. I said, now look, let me read it for you. Uh, I might be thumb sucking from somewhere. I said, no, no, uh, let me read it for you. And I like to, I, might not, I don't know, right, let me read it for you. I'll try. Genesis chapter 38. I'm starting from Genesis 38.
Genesis chapter 38. Right. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be an harlot. You know what it means? A prostitute, a whore. He thought that she was a harlot because she had covered her face. And he turned unto her by the way, by the roadside and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. I'm reading the Holy Bible. Don't take objection. I'm reading the Holy Bible to you. Allow me to come in unto you. And she said, What will thou give me? That thou mayest come in unto me. And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock, a goat kid, for doing me the favor. I'll send you a kid from the flock. And she said, will thou give me a pledge, a guarantee? Suppose you have a good time, jolly good time, and you go away and you don't send it. I want a guarantee, pledge, that till thou send it. And he said, the father-in-law telling his daughter-in-law, what pledge shall I give thee? What guarantee do you want? And she said, thy signet, your ring, and your bracelet, the old people, those days, you wear bangles, and your bracelet and your staff, the danda, the rod of Moses, which is in thine hand. And he gave it to her, and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. And she arose, and went away, and laid her by her veil from her, and put on the garment of her widowhood, and so on. And then twins are born, and they're struggling in the mother's womb, the same chapter 38. Ask the Christian who is asking you this, he said, read it. Beautiful continuity. Is that what you are hungry for? You see, this story, what I told you now, you'll remember all the time, because that is this type of story that we are apt to remember. You can visualize the old man going to Timna to share his sheep. He sees a woman sitting by the roadside. He thinks she's a prostitute. He comes up to her, and he makes a suggestion. He says, now, she says, what will you give me? Same what the prostitutes are doing day and night in London. Same type of religion. You can never forget. The Quran doesn't talk like that. Ya ahlul kitab, la taqlu fi dinikum, wa la taqulu ala Allah illa al-haq. Say, oh people of the book, don't say this, don't say anything but the truth. Innam al-masih, musad. This is how the Quran speaks, which is a very concentrated stuff. Therefore, the non-Muslim is finding difficult. And I sympathize with them. Because they're used to that, what we call, once upon a time, the fox and the grape, the wolf and the lamb, that is what they are used to. They say, look, this is not like that. God talks by telegrams, by faxes, and every Tom, Dick and Harry doesn't readily grasp a tele telegram or a telex or a fax. That's the fact of the matter. Thank you. Jazakallah. Before I hand back to the chairman, I would like to uh, firstly thank once again Mr. Isop Hansa and Mr. Nazim Badassi for the tremendous organization and hospitality. I don't want to do a vote of thanks, but I thought I, will, I must mention that on behalf of Mr. Ahmed Dilad. And finally, if all of you can't meet Mr. Dilad, after the lecture, please accept my apologies in advance. He has now left home some three weeks ago, working virtually seven days a week, lectures every night, and he won't be able to stay right till late to meet every one of you. So if some of you are inconvenienced, unable to meet him, please accept my apologies, but do bear in mind, his spirits are with you and all the brothers that were unable to make it for the meeting tonight. I now like to hand back to our chairman, Dr. Zaki, to bring the meeting to a close. Jazakallah and assalamu alaikum. It's every chairman's duty to bring a meeting to a close sometime, and that <coughs> falls to my sad lot tonight. I estimate we have 2,000 people here tonight, over 2,000. Does MD in this hall know how Alama Yusuf Ali died? If so, don't be bashful, put your hand up, and I would like to hear what you have to say. Does anyone know when he died or how he died? Is there no one? No one out of 2,000 who knows? No one. Well then, I will tell you. 
On Christmas Eve 1951, four years after the foundation of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, a British policeman was walking through Trafalgar Square at night uh, when he noticed a man lying on a slumped condition on a park bench. He phoned for an ambulance, ambulance came along, and the man was pronounced dead on arrival at hospital. Alama Yusuf Ali, his wife, who was a Christian, had abandoned him. His daughter, who was under his wife's influence, had also abandoned him. If you read the preface to his translation of the Quran, you will see there is a veiled reference to his personal circumstances. So, the British government, that is to say the Home Office, contacted the Pakistan Embassy and informed them that since this man had no family, if they did not take responsibility, he was going to be given a pauper's burial. The Pakistan Embassy refused to have anything to do with it. We say we don't know who he is. This man is not important to us. And Alama Yusuf Ali was given a pauper's burial under police escort. A week later, the obituary started appearing in the Times and elsewhere, the glowing tributes to the former civil servant and translator of the Quran, whereupon the Pakistani embassy realized what a blunder they had made and held a memorial meeting with the ambassador present at which everybody turned up and offered their condolences. So brothers, when we have governments like that in the Muslim world, is it any surprise that we are in the mess that we are in today? It only uh, 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 for <coughs> remains for me to close tonight's lecture with a, a proposing a vote of thanks to Brother Ahmed Didat for coming to South Africa and including us here in, on his tour of Britain and for giving such a brilliant and illuminating talk and also to the Islamic Propagation Centre headquarters here in London for organising this lecture. Thank you. <laughs>